received by the bank. Galaxy, you wouldn't see that, uh, 
you would have the positron and electron being formed there, and then you would see the gamma ray signal from somewhere way outside. So you can put some constraints on it that way. Um, we looked into that a little bit, but that wasn't the major part of my uh, project. The major part of it was looking at the WMAP data, the cosmic microwave background, and getting some constraints on some different properties of that. And so essentially what you've got here is the sort of blackish blue is uh, cold spots, the reddish yellow is sort of the warmer spots. And if we hope to put any constraints on dark matter particles, we're going to need to look at that and the energy that these dark matter particles could uh, dump into the universe when it was very young. Um, and so when uh, a particle, it, so when the, after the Big Bang, all these particles were in this giant thermal bath, or soup, I guess. Uh, and then eventually, once the universe expands too much, it sort of, they sort of freeze up and they essentially don't interact with themselves anymore for a long, long time. Um, and so the time in which the dark matter particles uh, freeze out is approximately when their interaction rate is the same as the Hubble expansion, or the expansion rate of time. Um, and so that's how we can get some of these constraints. Uh, I will s explain that a little bit. The next step. Um, so this is uh, positron production rate with the downscattering model. Essentially what we have here is an equation that helps describe how they would be produced at the center of galaxies now. And then we can use this and then we get another formula or equa um, yeah, I guess equation of it that we can extract from it to use to scale it back to the early years. So essentially you've got the rate of positrons being produced, which is equal to the abundance of uh, your stable state dark matter squared, uh, and then this sort of volume integral over the uh, thermally average cross section of two parts of dark matter work, dark matter particles interacting, multiplied by the density squared over the mass squared. The density squared over the mass squared is essentially the number density squared, and so if you've got the number density squared multiplied by the thermally average cross section, you get sort of all of the dark matter particles. So that equation that I said was. P scatter. And so uh, that's the one that you can extract from there, which is current day or current time data. And then so you can kind of shove it into this thing here. Uh, what you've got is the energy dumped into the early universe per unit time, per unit volume. And essentially what this formula is, it's a mix of the P scatter that I talked about. That is purely particle physics. Whereas all those constants, the C squared, the dark matter, uh, density parameters, the critical density parameters, and then the one plus z squared, those are all the astrophysics of uh, this equation. And essentially there's another Feynman diagram here, you've got the stable states coming in, scattering off into the ground states, and there will also be positron and electron pairs, but um, this is a graph of uh, the P scatter. Now, this alpha is a parameter, same with the RS of, sorry, let me just go back to this, of the density profile that we were using. And so essentially, um, it's just a contour plot of the parameter space of the P scatter. And what you've got is that orange region up there is from the WMAP data, which is that uh, diagram we really reinforced. Anything to the, I guess, right or above that is what you can count out. Um, just don't really see it. This blue line is for um, the Planck data that's coming up in 2013, that's the, what it would be predicted to look like. And so that's kind of what we're hoping to see, and it would constrain our model a little bit more. That dot is the best fit for our model uh, for the shape of the gamma ray signal that we see. Uh, then you can also consider uh, dark matter annihilation smooth one. It's essentially the same formula looking at the energy dumped in, uh, except for you change P scatter to P annihilate, which is kind of useful no matter where we're all the other. Uh, and essentially, P annihilate is a function of this sort of FMZ. Uh, it's a fudge factor for energy being carried away by the things like neutrinos and stuff like that. Uh, thermal average cross section again, and it's divided by the mass. That's, that's what I Another one is a uh, Feynman diagram for the annihilation. Two dark matter uh, particles coming in annihilating. These are um, dark photons. They essentially decay into the positron electron there. But I have some graphs for P scatter plus P and I. This is if you want to be considerable. Um, this graph here is for uh, dark matter.
remember with the mass of 7 GeV and the cross section of well, 2.6 times 10 to negative 26 centimeters uh, cubed per second. Uh, it's actually so with uh, with the lower mass, it pushes it uh, into quite a constrained region. Um, whereas if you were to look at a higher mass, it's still uh, it looks more like it would with just uh, p scatter. Uh, as I said, the mass and the cross section aren't exactly known, so these are just sort of values that we were testing. Um, so in conclusion, we have proposed a model of dark matter to explain the unknown source of gamma rays. Uh, we checked our results against current evidence. We have, uh, we hope to see some good results from the Planck data being released. And all of this uh, leads us to believe that we have a plausible model of dark matter. And Thank you to my supervisor at Fry, University of Winnipeg, to all my students and colleagues, they helped a bunch. CUPC for having me and all of you for listening.